A new study of over 1 million people has found impressive dementia risk reductions linked to cholesterol, but there's been huge controversy surrounding how we should think about cholesterol and brain health. Does lowering our blood cholesterol levels, is it actually helpful or harmful? Well, this new study gives us fresh data that helps to clarify what's really going on, and I'm going to cover some key risk factors for dementia that you can do something about starting today. So let's start with a worry. Could lowering our blood cholesterol levels actually harm our brain health? Because the brain is packed with cholesterol, and it holds about 20% of the body's total supply. So cholesterol in the brain is critical for building structures that enable neurons to communicate, and it plays a critical role in controlling the flow of that communication. So the question here is, if we lower our blood cholesterol levels too much, could that starve the brain of this crucial resource? Well, it actually depends on how we lower it. So interestingly, cholesterol, it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So the cholesterol in our brains, it doesn't get there from our blood. It's actually made by the brain itself. So if we lower our blood cholesterol levels by modifying our diet, for instance, this shouldn't be an issue. But the story is different with cholesterol-lowering medications like statins, because some evidence suggests that those medications can cross the blood-brain barrier and can lower cholesterol levels within the brain. That's the theory, but the evidence at the moment, it mostly comes from lab or animal studies. So do we see any evidence that statins negatively affect the brain in the real world? Well, early on, doctors began to notice cases where they suspected that statins were causing memory loss. So in a study published in 2003, for instance, it analyzed 60 such cases. And with many of them, stopping the statin medications led to an improvement in symptoms for those patients. But this type of evidence, it's only suggestive. What we ideally need is randomized controlled trials to really understand the effects of statins on cognitive health. So when we look at that type of data, what do we see? Well, the results from the PROSPER study were published in 2010. Researchers looked at the effects of pravastatin compared to the placebo in a group of elderly participants. After an average follow-up of 42 months, they found no difference in measures of cognitive decline between the two groups. There's a more recent study that was published last year. It analyzed the impacts of achieving very low LDL cholesterol levels through a combination of statins and a different type of cholesterol-lowering medication called PCSK9 inhibitors. So the median follow-up here for this study was five years. So the time period is much longer here compared to the previous study that we looked at. But again, there were no negative cognitive effects associated with treatment. So from the evidence we have so far, it doesn't look like statins or PCSK9 inhibitors affect cognitive health. But could they help? Well, here we wade into the middle of an ongoing controversy. So observational studies, they seem to give us one answer. They point to an association between treatment with statins and a lower risk of dementia. So for instance, a meta-analysis published this year combined 55 studies and included over 7 million patients. The researchers found that statins cut the risk of dementia by 14%. And when they looked at different subgroups, an even more impressive statistic jumped out to them. For those who used statins for more than three years, the risk reduction was a massive 63%. So what might explain this link? Why would statins help to combat dementia? It's important to remember that there are two main types of dementia. So on one hand, there's vascular dementia. So this results in plaque building up in the arteries that supply the brain, and that can lead to brain cells not getting enough oxygen, and the resulting damage can start to impair brain function. But then there's Alzheimer's disease. So this is basically a matter of damage to brain cells, but the mechanism is different. So here the damage is due to the accumulation of broken proteins around and inside neurons. Now, a key way that statins may help is by lowering LDL cholesterol, because high levels are a central causal factor of plaque accumulation. So this accumulation it plays a role in both types of dementia. And further, statins have anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects. So these have been proposed as potentially important mechanisms to counter both forms of dementia. So there are plausible mechanisms here to explain the link that we see in these observational studies. But these studies, they just tell us about associations, and it leaves us with questions about about causation. For example, some people have wondered if what we're seeing here is called healthy user bias. So this is where people who are receiving preventative treatments like statins are more likely to engage in other health protective activities like eating well and staying active. So it's possible that other factors, not just statin use, explain the dementia risk reductions. To tease this out, ideally we want data from randomized controlled trials to get a better sense of the true relationship. So this is where things get really puzzling, because to date, these kinds of trials, they haven't found significant impacts of statin medications on dementia risk. 
For example, a new meta-analysis of 20 trials with over 100,000 participants was just published in August. The findings? Using medications to lower our blood LDL cholesterol levels did not lower the risk of dementia. And by the way, there's a silver lining here. The cholesterol-lowering medications didn't harm cognitive health either. So this gives us one more data point to put to rest the worry that we addressed at the start of the video. But what explains the conflict between the observational studies and the randomized controlled trials? Well, we already looked at one possibility, so healthy user bias and other similar problems might be clouding the picture. But another important thing that we've learned is that age is a huge factor. In the observational studies, the association between statin use and lower dementia risk is stronger when those underwent treatment when they were younger. And research has found that LDL cholesterol levels in midlife, they're linked to risk of developing dementia later in life. So all of this points to a need to use statins over a long period of time, starting when we're younger, in order to protect our brains. But this means that the protective effects, they might not show up for a number of decades, which is why it might be very hard to capture that benefit in randomized controlled trials. Now, that might go some way to explain the conflict that we see between observational studies and controlled trials, but overall we're still not 100% sure. And this is why a new study of over 1 million people is so important. It gives us crucial data to clarify what's really going on here. So the study takes a unique approach. In normal randomized controlled trials, you randomize people into two groups. So one gets the placebo and the other gets some kind of intervention. Then after a fixed period of time, you see how the outcomes compare between the two groups. And as we just saw, there's a big drawback here when we're looking at an area like statins and dementia. If an intervention takes a really long time to make a difference, then we won't necessarily capture the effects within the time period of a normal trial. So it would be great to have a way to examine the impact of an intervention over a number of years. And there's actually a way to do this over a whole lifetime. So here's how it works. Statins and other medications that lower cholesterol, they work by targeting specific proteins or enzymes in the body. They turn them down or turn them off. But the interesting thing is that there are natural genetic variations that do the same thing. So in other words, people who are born with a gene that basically imitates a statin or other cholesterol-lowering medications. If we can identify those individuals, we have a set of people where it's like they've been taking this medication their whole life. They've never missed a dose. So when we compare them to a group of people who don't have that gene, then we have something that mimics a randomized controlled trial. But it lasts a lot longer and it's called a Mendelian randomization trial. So in this new study, researchers used this approach to investigate the long-term effects of three different cholesterol-lowering medications. So they looked at statins, azetamibe, and PCSK9 inhibitors. Each of these targets a different pathway to lower blood LDL cholesterol levels. And the risk reductions here were truly impressive. So for those who had a gene that simulated the impacts of statins, it was a relative risk reduction of 76%, and for azetamibe, it was 82%. So that gives a lot of weight to the idea that the observational studies are onto something. Long-term use of cholesterol-lowering medications appear to be highly protective when it comes to dementia. And this new Mendelian randomization trial adds further data to support that idea. Again, because people with a genetic variant that mimics a medication simulates taking that medication for their entire lives. And the nature of this analysis allows us to see what the short-term clinical trials might miss. But there was one surprising finding here from the study that raises an important question. So the researchers found that there wasn't a clear dementia risk reduction with people that had a genetic variant that mimicked PCSK9 inhibitors. So one type of analysis showed a protective effect, while the other two types of analyses showed none. So this is really interesting because PCSK9 inhibitors, they've got the most powerful effect on lowering LDL cholesterol levels. So this raises the possibility that it isn't just the lowering of LDL cholesterol that makes an important difference for dementia risk. The mechanism involved in the lowering might be just as important. But this is just one example of an area where more research is needed. There's still so much that we don't know, and it's really important for clinicians like me to acknowledge that there's still so much that we don't know, and we certainly don't have all the answers. But what are the practical takeaways here? What should we be doing to lower our dementia risks? Well, even though we've got more to learn, the evidence about the link between cholesterol and dementia is compelling. It's enough at this point that the Lancet Standing Commission ranked it as an important modifiable risk factor. So it's a bit like killing two birds with one stone here, because we already know that lowering LDL cholesterol reduces our risks of heart disease. But tackling high LDL cholesterol levels should also be a priority to slash our dementia risks. So what else does the list include? 
Well, there's a cluster of risk factors that include four things that are tightly related to each other, and they're also related to cholesterol levels. So those four are inactivity, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and obesity. So getting our diet and exercise right is imperative for controlling dementia risk. So you probably expected that those factors would be important, but the other four aren't so obvious. So for the first, consider an analogy. If we want healthy muscles, we need to use them. It's the same thing when we challenge our minds. It keeps our brains healthy and helps to avoid dementia. So research involving over 107,000 people found that those with high cognitive stimulation at work had a lower risk of dementia compared to those with low cognitive stimulation. So keep learning, stay curious, and challenge your mind. It's one of the best interventions that you can make for your long-term brain health. The second hidden risk factor is also about brain stimulation. So globally, about 20% of people have some form of hearing loss, and as we get older, that number only goes up. But that's a problem because when our ears aren't transmitting signals to our brain, our brain isn't getting the stimulation it needs, and it can start to wither away. So research shows a clear link between untreated hearing loss and an increased risk of dementia. So in a series of high-quality studies, participants with hearing loss were tracked over a five-year time period, and the results were striking. Those with untreated hearing loss had up to 2.4 times the risk of developing dementia. And it gets even more concerning. So for every 10 decibels of hearing loss, your dementia risk goes up by 16%. So the worse your hearing loss gets, the higher your risk becomes. But the good news is that hearing aids can help. A systematic review found that people with hearing loss who also used hearing aids had a significantly lower risk of cognitive decline and dementia compared to those who did not use hearing aids. So it's a simple intervention, but it can make a huge difference. The third hidden risk factor is similar. So just like our hearing, if our vision isn't great, the signals to our brain are weak. And a major meta-analysis looked at 14 different studies that followed over 6 million adults who were cognitively healthy at the start. And over the course of up to 14.5 years, those with vision loss had a significantly higher risk of developing dementia, about 47% higher to be exact. So what does that mean for us? If you or someone you know is experiencing vision issues, make sure that they take it seriously and fix it. Just like with hearing, taking control of your vision is another piece of the puzzle in protecting your brain health. And there's a fourth hidden risk factor that many people overlook. So a recent analysis looked at seven different studies that followed people over a 10 to 14 year period, and it found that those with depression had more than double the risk of developing dementia compared to those without depression. That's a big deal. But what's interesting here is that the increased risk is present for all adult ages, but it's especially relevant in midlife. So depression in midlife seems to be a strong predictor for dementia later on. But there's good news here too. The same studies found that people who treated their depression, whether it was through medication or therapy or a combination of both, had a significantly lower risk of developing dementia. So in fact, their risk reduction was about 30% compared to those who didn't get treatment. So if you're dealing with depression or you know someone who is, seeking treatment isn't just about improving your mental health today. It can also be a critical step in protecting your brain over the long term. And this is also linked to social isolation. So systematic reviews have linked social isolation with an increased risk of dementia. So prioritizing social connections, especially as we age, is essential. And once we've got those main risk factors sorted out to protect our brains, there are a couple of supplements that do have some evidence. So let's look at three of them briefly. So a large trial looked at the effects of taking the first supplement daily over a two-year period. The researchers discovered relative improvements in overall cognition and memory. The effect on cognition was the equivalent to reducing the aging of the brain by two years. The supplement was a multivitamin and mineral. The second supplement is one that we've been using for decades to boost exercise performance and muscle building. The supplement is creatine, and I'm sure that many of you have heard about its muscle benefits. Our bodies can make creatine, but our diet is also a key source. It plays an important role in energy production in our muscles, and that's where most of the creatine gets used, but it's also found in the brain, and our brains need a lot of energy to function properly. So creatine helps to produce this energy quickly, and it supports critical brain processes like memory and thinking. And recent research has showed that creatine supplements can increase the amount of creatine in the brain, and a meta-analysis published in 2022 showed that creatine supplements improved memory performance compared to a placebo, and the effect was particularly strong for older adults. Finally, there is one other supplement linked to exercise that also shows promise when it comes to brain health. 
The supplement is TMG. It's got a really interesting link to Alzheimer's disease. So in 2020, a large review of the risk factors of Alzheimer's disease found that high levels of homocysteine, which is an amino acid, were strongly linked to Alzheimer's. It went on to say that homocysteine lowering treatment seems to be the most promising intervention for Alzheimer's disease prevention. And what's interesting is that TMG lowers homocysteine. So in other words, TMG may reduce a risk factor for Alzheimer's by lowering homocysteine levels. Now, this is not a guaranteed way to prevent Alzheimer's, but it's a promising area of research and another potential benefit with TMG supplements. So personally, I take a multivitamin and mineral along with creatine and TMG as part of microvitamin plus powder. But just because I take a supplement does not in any way mean that you should as well. But one thing that doesn't show up in the Lancet's list is a mineral deficiency that a recent study has linked to Alzheimer's disease. So make sure to check out this next video here to learn about that study and whether it gives us a new way to further lower our risks.